Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from one of our special guests. Father, we thank you tonight for your grace, for your goodness. We thank you for this moment in history. Here we are in October 2014 in the middle of Missions Month. And we are just in awe of the fact that you've chosen to use us. And we pray tonight that, Holy Spirit, you will deposit something in every one of our hearts, from the preacher through to the last person into the building, that we will have something that we'll walk away with from you. We pray for those that we're standing next to tonight. We pray a blessing all over them. And Lord, even as we go to your word tonight, let miracles happen in your house. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Give someone a hug or a high five. Tell them they're awesome. You love them. And uh, it is great to be here. You ready for the word? I'm not sure if you realize this, but if we're going to go on mission, if we are going to be men and women that make a difference in the world in which we live, there is something we've got to discover, and it's called our God shape. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but you have a certain shape. Not just physically, but God has constructed you in such a way that you have got an incredible tomorrow. If we could understand the way that we're shaped today. It was a few weeks ago, I was walking through a shopping center and there was a young guy and he had tattooed on the inside of his arm, Jeremiah 2911. Immediately, I knew what that meant. And many of you would have heard many scriptures or many messages around this chapter because the Bible says, for I know the thoughts that I, that I think towards you, says the Lord. They are thoughts of peace and they are thoughts that are not of evil and they are to give you a future and a hope. And I'm thankful tonight that we're in a church that preaches about a God purpose. Come on, you can't come into this church and not, again, have the adrenaline of the Holy Spirit that's lifting you up to go, you know what? I'm not just bound to the house where I live. I'm not just bound to the life that I've experienced to date, but I'm loved by a God that has a great tomorrow for me. Come on, I need a bit of an amen. Because if you don't respond, I'll get boring. We'll lock the doors. We'll get out of here about 1030 tonight. But if you do respond, I'll be over quick. That's a far better response than Pastor Jim gets. (laughs) You know, in the church today across the world, we have a great theology that's emerged about how much God loves us. Do you know that God loves you despite you? God doesn't love you because you're good for Him. God doesn't love you because you live a righteous life. The Bible declares that God so loved the world in sin that he gave everything he could give. You can never, I can never earn more of God's love. It's an amazing thing. When you get a revelation that you're loved by God, you know what? Everything begins to change. Because you don't now have to earn God's love. You begin to focus on, well, what am I here for then? And then we've had a lot of great teaching over the last 10 years about purpose about the fact that we have a destiny, a greater tomorrow than our yesterday. And I thank God for that because when you're loved by God, you know that God has good thoughts towards you and that your thoughts are for a future and a hope. What I don't think we have discovered yet in the church is not only are we loved and we have a purpose, but we are designed. You are actually designed peculiar, peculiar way by God himself. And when you begin to understand you have a God shape, your life becomes missional. There are so many depressed Christians. I travel all over the world. In fact, we've just come back from Europe. We've been in Spain. We've been in Holland twice. We've been in London. And here we are in America. We'll be going home on Thursday. We'll be back for church on Sunday. And wherever you go over the world, it's amazing to me how many dissatisfied Christians there are. 
They come to church and they will worship in a worship atmosphere, but they're not bringing worship. Worship comes at them and lifts them. But they're actually deep down dissatisfied and even at times despondent because they have failed to function in their fit. God shape. They don't understand the way that God has dis- designed them. I think our greatest tragedy in life is not death, but it's for us to live outside of our design. I want you to think about this for a moment. Because you see, many of us are here tonight and we have compared ourselves for much of our life with a sibling. Or maybe we're in a particular job or we're in church ministry and we compare ourselves with someone else continually and the enemy keeps us comparing because he doesn't want us to stop long enough and discover our fit, our design, our shape. You see, we carry a belief that God can do it. We believe that God's word is true, but many of us fail to activate our mission because we don't know our design. Are you hearing me? See, mission requires we activate our design. Last week here at The Rock, we had Reinhard Bonnke. You know, if you want to get depressed, just be a pastor and sit under Ryan Hart Bonke's ministry. I mean, I, I thought Pastor Jim was doing an amazing thing tonight, led by the Holy Spirit to see people come to Christ. But when you talk about, what was it, 77 million cards? But we do it all the time. We compare. But you know what? I'm not designed to be Ryan Hart. I applaud what God is doing through that design. I'm not designed to be your pastor. He's not designed to be me. You're not designed to be someone that you thought you would like to be. You're designed to be you. That's why tonight my prayer is this is not just a visiting speaker dropping in on the rock, but something's going to shift in this month of mission that you're going to go, you know what? I'm going to begin to lift up my head because I'm going to discover my design. Let's go to the Bible. You ready? 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12. The Apostle Paul writes some amazing insight. He says, for as the body is one and as a human body has many members, all the members of that one body being many are one body, so it is in Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free." And have all been made to drink into one spirit. Verse 14. For in fact the body is not one member, but many. Everybody say many. Many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Imagine being designed as the foot. You live an undercover life most of the time. It smells a lot in your territory, especially if you live in a hot country. Foot can easily say, you know what? How come I'm a foot? Why why do I have to always have something wrapped around me? Why does all the pressure of everything above me end with me? Come on, you getting me? We do this in the body all the time. It's like, why do I have to do that? Why couldn't I be the hand? Because the hand gets to wear the rings. Come on, the hand gets to do new things all the time. The hand is able to be very creative. The hand, oh, if I was only a hand. And yet Paul says, just because you're not what you want to be, does that make you not of the body? By the way, if the ear should say, I'm not an eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? And if the whole were hearing, where would the smelling be? Now, this is where it really gets interesting. Verse 18, listen to what the Apostle Paul writes. He says, but now God, everyone say God. God. Not God, God. God. God has set the members, each one of them, in the body to do what they want to do. (laughs) 
He set you in the body so you can feel good about a great tomorrow. He set you in the body because he loves you that much. No, 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 no. He, God, has set the members each, not grouping, not families, not you and your sibling, you and your spouse, each one, this is powerful, in the body, just the way he wanted it. Now, you are the body of Christ, members individually. I I took some time a couple of weeks ago, and I I just looked at this passage again. It's not a new passage, 1 Corinthians 12. And, you know, I don't have time to get into this, but this whole passage talks about if you're going to find your design, you need to surrender to self. You need a revelation of personal value. You need to be committed to unity. You need to lift your level of personal obedience. And you need to activate honor. How many know that is a whole lot of work? Come on. And that's why so many of us, even tonight, maybe you're watching online and you're sitting there at home or you're watching us somehow, even on a computer screen, and you go, you know, I I, I just feel dissatisfied all the time. And God's saying, you know, I love you and I do have a future, but your future doesn't really materialize with fulfillment until you discover your design. And it's not what you would like to do necessarily, although that comes into it. It's actually the Father's heart and design for you. And so I want to look at that and I'm going to say, God, I want to be a part of an army of people who together are releasing the kingdom of heaven. See, I've discovered there are basically three levels of living. And that's the same if you're a Christian or not, but particularly in the church, there are three kinds of levels of living. And this would affect everybody that's listening to this message tonight. Here's the first one is you can believe in God, but live disengaged. In other words, you have never really engaged like a cog with another cog to create what God wants to build. And, and maybe it's because, you know, you fear getting out of your boat. Maybe it's because you've never dealt with your own insecurity. Or maybe you lack the ability to believe that God's designed you for a particular and peculiar purpose. You see, I realize the Bible teaches that everything I need is in the house. Come on, the oil is in the house. See, it's the same with your life. For me as a pastor, everything we need to go forward in the mission and purpose of God is already in our house. But everything you need is already in your house. And God's saying, hey, it's not about one day when this happens. No, you are called to be on mission now. So don't live disengaged. I'm sure you've heard of Pastor Rick Warren. He says this, fear is a self-imposed prison that will keep you from becoming what God has created you to be. I wonder if sometimes we've allowed fear to rule us. Remember when Jesus, or rather when Moses in the desert has an encounter with God? Remember that? And God says, Moses, I'm going to use you to release my people. And Moses begins to stutter and he says, look, I've been looking after sheep for 40 years. I can't speak. If you want me to be the spokesperson, the leader, I can't speak. You know what God said to him? Moses, who made your mouth? Just because you can't speak now doesn't mean that if I call you to do this, you can't do this. You can do this. You know, we've had a lot of teaching like things like, well, the Holy Spirit gives you gifts. But the theology we have behind it is one day, maybe when we were born, the Holy Spirit just set a deck of gift cards and says, here's yours and here's yours. And here's this is what I've discovered. The Holy Spirit is not a one time gift giver. If he wants you to do something, he can give you something in that moment and he gives it without repentance. He gives you something to move into. His design releases your ability, my ability to take hold of something in God. Come on, don't live disengaged. So I come to the rock because I need my spiritual adrenaline pump. Come on, I need my worship fix. And God says, no, 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 no. We need to worship, but it's not about pumping you up so that the enemy can deflate you. You've got to start getting engaged, not disengaged. 
Come on, don't just keep coming to church and not getting on mission. God needs you wherever it is inside the church, out in the community, doing things that are going to make a difference to this incredible needy city that God has got a future for. And God's saying, don't you live just saying, well, that's for pastor and that's for brother so-and-so. No, God says, don't you dare live disengaged. You've been designed by God and don't allow your fear or your lack of self-worth to stop you. You see, kingdom potential always requires personal placement. So we say, well, God, use me. And God says, well, then get up. <laughs> well, God, when, when you speak to me, I already have. I wrote a whole book. <laughs> That's your manual. What else do you need? It's just get up and start engaging. Don't live. Come on, disengaged. How many are relating to this? Yeah. You know, a couple of Sundays, I think it was two or three Sundays ago, I, I'm in now. And our foyer, before we start our Sunday, we, we, our first service is 8 a.m. in the morning. Our last one finishes at, or starts at 7.15 at night. We've got five services throughout the day, and I'm there at 7.30, and this guy comes up to me. His name's Ray. He's an amazing guy. He said, oh, pastor, how are you? I said, Ray, how you doing, mate? He says, oh, I'm fantastic. Ray always talks to me. The amazing thing about Ray is Ray is 91. He's there at 7.30 in the morning. He says, Pastor, not too many people. Can I grab you for a minute? I said, go for it, Ray. How are you doing? Oh, I'm fantastic. I said, no, 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 no. You're not just fantastic, Ray. You need to hear something from me this morning. You're a champion. <laughs> then he says, no, no, no. You're the champion. I said, no, you are the champion. He's not living a disengaged life. He says, no, no, Pastor, you're the champion. I said, you're the champion. I said, because I had forgotten his age. I said, tell me again how old you are. He says, I'm 91. In March, I'll be 92. I said, see, you're the champion. <laughs> then he said, oh, I'm, I've nearly finished my book, Pastor. I said, what are you doing? I, he says, I'm writing a book. I'm not going to write too much about the war. He was in the front line of the war. But I want to write about my life story, he said, because you know what? If I live my life all over again, he says, yeah, I didn't do everything right. and I've had some challenges, but I'd live it exactly the way I lived it. 91. said, that's amazing. He said, I've got a great family. In fact, he said, my son's just had his birthday. I said, that's amazing, Ray. He said, yeah, he's become a pensioner. <laughs> How many know perspective changes? But this is the spirit of it. He's not living disengaged he's living engaged Come on, I wonder if God looked at you tonight I wonder if you're living disengaged because you got hurt maybe somebody told you that you couldn't really make a difference and here we are in the month of mission and God's saying hey Moses I made your mouth hey Sam I designed you you've got a fit you've got a place and you need to make sure that you're going to discover that as you move past a place of just waiting to see if anything ever changes. We live disengaged. Secondly, we live distracted. See, I, I'm an observer of people, and it's amazing to me how you can start out full of fire and ready to do something great for God, but then stuff happens, things come along, and before we know it, we're distracted. You know, the Great Commission... Today, unfortunately, much of the church has become a man-made mission. Come on, it's all about us. It's all about what we get out of it. I'll never forget when I was living in Sydney, meeting a man who was a multi-millionaire, and he'd gone through some things, and he sort of, I bumped into him a number of times. He said, hey, Pastor Paul, could I, could I get some time with you? And I said, sure. And I began to build a relationship with him. He had a beautiful wife, three I think if I remember correctly, three great children, very successful business. And then he began to open his heart and he said, you know what? I feel as empty as anything. And I said, well, tell me about your life. And he just said, look, I've spent my whole life working. I've spent my whole life building my business. And it's kind of like, I feel like there's just nothing worth living for. He had a belief in God, but he had lived for many years distracted. Can I just say something from Little Wee New Zealand to everybody listening tonight? And again online, I'm speaking to you. It's like, don't allow the things of this world to be the stuff that takes your life. 
Because you can have all the stuff and actually get your business, get your car, get your house, get your wife, get your husband, get the things and end up more empty than when you began all of that. Because you haven't found your God design. In fact, Proverbs eleven twenty eight: a life devoted to things is a dead life. It's a stump, the message Bible says. But a God-shaped life is a flourishing tree. Come on, how many would be big enough tonight to say, you know what, pastor, I need to hear this. Because when I look at my life, I praise God loud on Sunday. I praise God in his worship bracket in church service. But I look at my life, it's a stump. There's just nothing there. And God says, because you've allowed the distractions to rule you. You know, it was David Livingston who said these words, one of the great missionaries. He says, if a commission by an earthly king is considered to be an honor, how can a commission by a heavenly king be considered a sacrifice? You know what? God's designed you. God's kingdom awaits your engagement so that the body can begin to see something it's never seen before. And we think, well, there's one or two anointed people know the Great Commission. How many know the Great Commission? It was what Jesus gave to the disciples. Hey, come on, team, we're all in. It's not just Pastor Jim at the front of a church. We're all in. I want you to go into your world. That's what Jesus said. And I want you to make disciples of all Nations, I want you to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I want you to teach them to observe all things I've commanded you. We're all in. How many have heard the Great Commission many times? In this church, you would have. Listen to the Great Commission a different way. See, the word commission is made up of two other words. Com. Mission. Not just Commission. But commission. It's a mission that has a commandment in front of it. This is not an optional thing. It's like you want to find peace and fulfillment. Wherever you are, you've got to bring Jesus to people. Wherever you are. Come on. You are designed to be a light bearer. You are designed to be, again, the answer to those that are around you. Commission is made up of commission and it's made up of commission. In other words, everything that you do is about other people. When you find your design, you realize I'm not living for me anymore because my mission in life, my purpose in life is to carry the commandment and to include other people around me. And then I begin to come alive. If you're here tonight and you've been distracted by other things, then let me just remind you that life is emotion if it doesn't have meaning. It's an activity if it doesn't have God's authority. And it's a mission without a mandate. See, I've, I've come to realize it's not just pastors that are chosen. It's all of us that we are living a high and holy calling. Are you giving me? Are you hearing me tonight? So are you living disengaged? Are you living distracted by material things? Now, there's nothing wrong with material things, but they cannot be the number one priority? Or are you thirdly living designed? You say, well, Paul, I want to learn how to be designed. You know, God says that we are designed. He's created us a certain way. Ephesians 2 and verse 10, we are God's masterpiece. Wouldn't it be good to wake up every morning in this next week and say, I am a masterpiece. Come on, God, you made me a masterpiece. You created me and you in Christ Jesus so that we could do the good things that he planned for us long ago. Are you hearing that? God's got a plan for your next week. Come on, God's got a plan for your next year. God's got a plan. We are in the plan of God. We're designed. We're created by God. And I want to live design. You know this, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Do you not know that your body, your human life is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. Therefore, you were brought with a price and glorify God in your body and in your spirit. Love it. We're designed. So don't be disengaged. It'll test you, but it's not going to trap you. 
Come on, as you begin to move into the things that God has. I love this in the Message Bible, 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. Just so you get some scripture. But you are the ones chosen by God. Listen to this. You're chosen by God. You're chosen for a high calling of priestly work. Chosen, designed to be a holy people. God's instruments to do his work and to speak out for him, to tell others of the night and day difference he made for you. From nothing to something. From rejected to accepted. Come on, I am preaching better than you're responding. It's kind of like... God, you designed me. Even tonight, if there's one thing you leave this place, it's like, I'm not an afterthought. I'm not just even a Christian trying to be happy. I'm designed and I'm going to begin to engage who I am. So that God can begin to take me to a new level. I'll never forget the story. I may have mentioned it here. There was a great elderly Indian lady in our church in Sydney. Every Sunday as I was walking through to lead a service or preach, she'd grab me on the arm. She'd say, Pastor, I'll never forget her because she had not an ounce of fat on her bony fingers and she was always dressed in a sari. She'd grab my arm. She says, Pastor, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you and Pastor Maria. I'm praying for you and your family. I'm praying for you every, every week. She would actually hide, I'm sure, in the foyer because we would walk through and she would grab me. I'm praying for you. I loved it. I said, thank you, Amy. Every week, thank you, Amy. One particular Sunday, she caught me by surprise because she grabbed my arm and she said, I'm praying. I said, thank you, Amy. And she said to me, Pastor, I need to see you. I need to see you. She was 83. And I said, what's that about? She said, would you come to my place on Thursday and see me? And I knew that I had weeks booked up. She would never understand that. And I just, I knew she was frail. I knew she was such a godly woman. I just said, for sure. And, and I just said to my PA, you work it out. You change the other appointments. Thursday came, I went to her place for lunch. Tell you a little bit of a story. We were in the first building project we'd ever had. And my pastor, I was second in charge and trusted me to raise the funds, I didn't know how to do it. And one of the first steps we had to do was raise $360,000 as a deposit. I said, God, how are we gonna do that? And I just felt God said, well, if you could get 1,000 units of $360, you'd have 360,000. Some people could pull together and make 360, some could give 360, some could give 10 times 360. So I put that to the church and I'd done that a couple of weeks before and she grabbed me this Sunday and said would you come and see me and I I went to her place and I thought I'd find a house there was no house just a big building and I opened the front door and there's a long corridor I'll never forget it one bathroom that serviced eight rooms hers was right up the end and as I got close I saw the number and I, so I began to knock on the door I could smell the curry coming out from underneath she had prepared a meal and she opened the door and it's the delight in her face I can't describe Tears in her eyes, and she was just, Pastor, you're here. Pastor, you're here. Smallest room you could imagine, just a single bed. Not even a seat to sit on. There was just old apple boxes with cloths over it. At the end of her bed was a little gas stove where she did the cooking. And then would wash the utensils back in the bathroom afterwards. The poorest of poor. It was just amazing in a big city like Sydney. We talked, and she prayed for me, and we talked, and she prayed for me, and... Looked at my watch, I knew time had gone, two, two and a half hours, and I was already late for the other appointments. I said, Sister Amy, I'm, I'm going to have to go. I'm, I, I just have to go. And she said, oh, Pastor, Pastor, before you go, one more thing, one more thing. She got up and she just shuffled. I'll never forget it. And at the end of her bed was a box of papers, and she went through the pocket, papers, and she picked this up, this envelope, and she said, Pastor, this is for you. And I said, what's this? She says, oh, she said, two weeks ago, you said to the church that we need to raise the deposit. I said, Amy, you, you don't need to. No, 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 Pastor, you need to take this. I said, what is it? She said, well, two weeks ago when you said you wanted 1,000 units of $360, I went home because two years ago I felt the Holy Spirit tell me to start saving my pension. So every week I faithfully put money into this envelope. And on the day you announced it, I went home and I counted up what was in there. There was $360.
in the envelope. And this is for you. All I wanted to say is, you know what? You keep it. I'll rob a bank. <laughs> I got some contacts in San Bernardino. <laughs> some of them sitting on the front row. I get a feeling of this section, over in this section. <laughs> Anybody get a witness? Yeah, I get a witness. Even people online are putting their hands up right now. But here's the reality. Amy passed away, I think, three months after she handed me the envelope. I believe to this day she lived her design. Wouldn't it be a great thing if this wasn't just a church about great services, but this was a church around everyone, not having to be anyone else, but living their design. Amy has had more impact on me than just about some of the greatest, biggest things you could imagine that have happened to me, because she's the widow woman that did what God asked her to do. And I want to challenge you today. You know, God has wired you to live your design, to live it to the maximum. You might say to me very quickly, well, Paul, how do I do that? Just three very, very quick thoughts about how you live your design. We don't live disengaged. We don't live distracted. We do live designed. And to do that, number one, it's going to involve a world beyond self. You can't live God's design if self is always in the front. Come on, people say, why do you travel so much, work so much? I'm dealing with churches all the time that have major issues and we're building a church at home, but we can't, I cannot be motivated about building self before others. And when you begin to realize that your life is about the commission, that you live beyond the world of self like Amy, your life begins to discover its design. You know, you say, well, I could never preach. Well, thank God. Because you imagine if we're all preachers, live your design, live for something beyond self. Live a life, secondly, that increases the lives of others. You say, well, how do I find my deserve, design? Beyond self and something that increases the life of others. We're here to build other people up. What are you doing this week that's going to actually lift somebody else above where you are? I am come that you might have Life and that life abundantly, said Jesus. You know, people say, well, I don't know about a blessed life. Jesus didn't have much. No, the Bible says Jesus became poor, that through his poverty, you might be rich. Can you imagine if we begin to have an attitude of we're here to lift others up beyond ourselves? Come on, we're up to put self second and the kingdom and the purposes of God first. Imagine what would begin to happen with that. You say, well, how do I, how do I find my design? Live beyond self. Live lifting others before who you are. And then thirdly, I believe design incorporates a combination or a partnership of these three things. Passion. What you're passionate about helps you understand your design. Not just passion, but productivity. And then ultimately, kingdom purpose. People say, I don't know what God's wired me to do. Well, what are you passionate about? What are you productive at? Come on, what do you do that has results and what builds the kingdom? That's all you have to marry. How many are thankful if, if somebody is, I, I remember somebody saying to me years ago, you know, God's told me to, to, to create an album, uh, like a, a singing album, but I'd heard them sing. And I had the role as a pastor to say, no, I think you're called to sing in the shower, but not on an album. <laughs> Come on, and people say, well, that's a bit rough. No. You know, if God's designed you a certain way, he doesn't design duds. And if you can't sing, don't get so insecure and say, you're talking about me now, are you? No, what I'm saying is if God wants you to create an album, you'll have a, so a, a voice that can carry an album. Yeah, but I'm passionate about it. I don't give a flip what you're passionate about. If you're not productive in it, it's not God's will for your life. 
And if you are productive, but you're not passionate about it, come on, you've got to have passion, productivity, and kingdom purpose. Those things, three things, you get those things. Well, all I, all I think about is making a difference in the kids in our community. Passion. And when you, when you work with kids, oh, they love me. Productivity. And then I want to see them come to know Jesus as Savior. Kingdom purpose. Come on, don't, don't stuff your whole life up. I don't know what God wants me to do. No. Come on, what are you passionate about? What are you productive in? And what builds kingdom purpose? You know, in our church, we've got so many business people that didn't know what their purpose was coming alive. I think of one couple. They've just come alive because I've taught them. Their role is in business. They love the people working for them. Many, many employees. They actually own a sports team. They don't just help oversee the team. They now pastor all of the team and their families. I said, you are a pastor in the community. You've always been passionate about it. You always do a good job. And you want to bring the values of the kingdom into people's lives. You're on fire. And I believe that Bishop T.D. Jake says, if you can't figure out your purpose, then figure out your passion. Start somewhere. For your passion will lead you right into your purpose. Come on, we should be proud. No, I don't know if I want to do that more. Well, if you're not passionate, find something you are passionate about. Then you can get happy and we'll get happy because you are. Just get on with it. You're not going to close with this thought. I had this thought a few weeks about, uh, about, I don't know if you've ever seen F1 racing cars, Formula One racing cars. If you're into Formula One racing cars, they are the fastest racing cars, I think, on the planet. And so they spin around these tracks. But what got my attention is as I began to think about it, is I thought these drivers are subject to 4G plus forces. And I began to think, you know what they have to do for these cars and their drivers is if you own a company or one of the, the groupings of the F1 cars and you want to win races, you're going to have to find someone who's passionate, somebody who can drive it fast, and somebody who buys into the vision of the team. Same thing. And then what you do is you design a seat for that person. Because when you hop in that seat, you discover there are certain things that have gone into the makeup of that seat is that the seat is designed for safety. It's designed lightweight, very strong, so that if an accident happens, they can pull you and the seat out in an instant. Not only is it designed for safety, it's designed in a low position. Because the lower you are, the more center of gravity drops in the car to give better performance. They make it out of a material to make it as light as possible, but without any giving in to strength. And it is made for your protection. Think about this for a moment. Do you know that God's designed you until you get into your seat? The trouble with the F1 seat is when you hop in, you feel completely restricted. Because there's no room to move. And us Christians want to have all of the decisions ourselves. You hop into the seat, you can't move. But you need that because when you go through the corners, you're not thrown away. You have that because when you spin out of control, it's your safety net. Come on. You are low in the car so that 98% of your vision is forward and not backward. Some of you need to hear this. God wants to take you on a journey to get you into your design. You're going to feel restricted at the start, but you're going to get safe and find his protection when you hit the corners in your life. And when things that the devil tries to throw at you, you are going to find your way all the way through. And the exhilaration comes because you're in the right seat that was designed for you. Job 10 and verse 8 says, God, your hands shaped me. 
and made me. You got two choices. You can love God and live disengaged or distracted. Or you can love God and say, God, I want you to help me find my design. And I want to pray as I hand back this service for every person in here that says, you know what? I want to find that God seat. If that's you, stand to your feet wherever you are. You know you're on a mission. You know that you're here to discover that. Come on. So the team join me very quickly. How many believe that God has got so much for us? Come on, lift both hands in the air and just say, God, I'm standing in your presence right here, right now. You know, in one moment, the Holy Spirit can ignite every one of us to a new level. I want you to see yourself finding that seat. It's going to feel pressured at the start. It's going to even feel maybe lonely because you're in that seat. Keep your hands up because God's ministering right now. But God's got something particular and peculiar. We're in a month of mission and God says, you're my hands. You're my eyes. You're my voice. You're my feet. You're my heartbeat. You might say, I, I, I got not a whole lot of gifts. I, I, I just love people. Somebody laying next to a father's heart, mother's heartbeat, is one of the greatest healers. You don't even have to be good at a whole lot of stuff. Maybe you're just going to draw people in close, let them hear the heartbeat. There's someone that cares enough. Holy Spirit, we take this moment. And we know it only takes one moment, one dew drop from heaven that ignites us. And we love you. We love your house. We love the togetherness. But we've read in your word that the body doesn't work unless the whole body does what it's been designed to do. And I pray over this church, I pray everybody watching online that we will find our God shape. That we'll be like the Amy's of this world, that it doesn't have to be a whole lot. It just has to be you. And I come against fear tonight. I come against discouragement. I come against insecurity. Disappointment of the past. But like the F1 driver, we're going to hop into a new seat and we're going to have little view of what's behind us. We're going to start looking to what's in front of us. And I pray, God, that there will be an army in this place that will be on mission inside the church, outside the church, in the city. We'll begin to bring life change as we give you the glory. In the name of Jesus. Come on, let's put our hands together. And honor God. There's a bunch of you tonight. Give me some lights in the house of God that you need to give your life to Jesus Christ. If you go any longer, why go another service? Why wait until the end of the service? Tonight you know you need to make the turn and come on home to Jesus. Tonight you know that you're in this place for a reason. Tonight you have a divine, that means godly, divine appointment with your creator. Tonight is your night. Now hear me, you're gonna feel funny about doing this, but who gives a flip about who's feeling funny or not? We don't care about what people think. We care more about what God sees and what God says. And tonight is your night of salvation. And I want you to just to get out of your seat. You know who you are. Just get out of your seat. You can bring your coat and your purse or your Bible or whatever you came with. And I want you to get in the aisle and meet me right here in front. We're going to pray tonight. Tonight is your night of salvation. Don't miss this. Don't ask your neighbor if you can. You know what I'm talking about. It's in your heart. Get out of your seat. Get in the aisle. And you just come. People are already coming right now. You come. Just come right now. Holy Spirit, let's sing that again as they come. Come on. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience Come on. Just get out of your seat and come. It's your time with God. Let us become more aware of your presence. You know, the glory of your you know, if you would die, you'd go to hell. Are you at least not sure where you'd go? 
tonight you can make sure. Come on. Tonight is your night. Don't hold back. You know that you need to be up here in front. You know, I'm going to tell you, by the Spirit of God, there's twice as many people as this. You don't have to get down on your knees. You don't have to do any of that. You just need to get your stuff, get out of your seat, and come. Say to your neighbor, I'll go with you if you need to. Get out of your seat and come. We're going to sing that song again. And you know you need to turn the road in your life. You know you need to leave that old trash behind. You know you need to get free. Tonight is your night of salvation. Tonight you're going to have to make this step. Jesus stepped for you, a beaten, bloody mess. Went to the cross at Calvary to give you freedom. Now you're going to have to come and walk a safe aisle to receive him in this place tonight. Tonight is your night of salvation. Let's just sing that again as they come. You come, come. Become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Come on. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. They're still coming. You come too. You can get out of your seat and come. I'll give you just a moment more. And you're going to miss this. You're going to miss what life is all about. You need to come. Just say the heck with what anybody else says. Man, I need God. And if that's you, you need to come. They're still coming. Come on. Come on. It's okay. You come. We're, we're waiting for you. We love you. We're waiting for you to come. You know who you are. Get out of your seat. Some of you big old tough men, you need to stop messing with God and get up here. Because I'll tell you what, when you face up with God, there's not about who's big and who's tough. He's tough. The rest of us are followers. Get out of your seat and come. Come on. It's time to come. It's time to come. It's time to come. It's time to come. One more time, Erica. you for a moment when the fires of hell hit your butt you will wish you listened to me you need to stop messing with God and you need to get out of your seat and you need to come and someone needs to tell you like it is because I'm fighting for your soul right now and the devil's fighting against me trying to keep you back and I can feel you in this place and you need to come because you don't want to go to hell you want to go to heaven. And tonight is your night of salvation. Do not miss it. Tonight God brought you here. It's a divine appointment with God. You need to get out of your seat. We're going to sing that one more time. And that's your time. Grab your stuff and get up here. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience I'll give the Lord a great big hand clap for all of these wise people. Thank God you've come. Put a smile on your face. The good thing. Pastor Joel, this is my buddy, Pastor Joel. Listen to me. No weird stuff goes on. He's just going to pray with you, give you some free stuff. He's not going to, there's no, come on, you, we'll make room for you. People in the foyer, come on if you're coming out of the foyer. We love you. He'll give you some free stuff. He'll tell you about a, a program we have called Spiritual Personal Trainers. 
Man, it's wonderful. Don't go back to your seat. Just make a left turn. Follow Pastor Joel right over there. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Isn't God good? Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God that I'm saved and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.